Then with the others, I'll turn my video on when you have five minutes left. Hey, Thanks. hi. <clears throat> I hope you can hear me and see my slides. Yes. So, uh, uh, so this is uh, going to be, I think, one odd one out this morning, because this is actually experimental talk. So I uh, just, uh, I'm uh, working on the University Hospital in Nijmegen in Eastern Netherlands, uh, which is a city just next to the border and with the with Net, uh, with Germany. And I would like to tell you a little bit about how we uh, how I started to use Erdikit in uh, actually running experiments. So uh, one disclaimer, this important one, is that that uh, I have a lot of slides that are typically are typically talking to biologists to medical doctors. So a lot of slides will be will depict structures in more cartoonish ways. So sorry for that. Uh, but so I wanted to show you, tell you a little bit about uh, how we are, uh, what we are doing as a laboratory, and what's our mission, and how the uh, Erdikit is helping us to uh, to help patients. Uh, so let me see if I can get this working right. So this is a typical slide that people show that about metabolism. It's uh, from CAC it's showing there is a metabolism in living cells is complex. There's a lot of nodes which are metabolites and reactions. They're catalyzed by enzymes. And if you look at it, you can cluster this into certain aspects like mitochondrial metabolism here or pyramid and nucleotide biosynthesis here or glycolysis here. And uh, sometimes uh, the genes that are encoding enzymes that are facilitating these reactions will have the defects like the UMP synthase here or pyruvate dehydrogenase here. Uh, and then uh, this usually has a, a phenotype the patient is suffering. And often if you want to diagnose this, you would like to characterize functionally whether there is uh, this reaction is active or not. So one way to assess whether there is an uh, active flux to a reaction is to put a metabolic tracer to it. Uh, through to the whole biological system and to try to follow how this label is metabolized in people. Okay? So let's just a very short example. Uh, so we have a reaction called pyruvate dehydrogenase. This is the one that uh, knocks out one carbon dioxide from pyruvate to create acetyl-CoA. And acetyl-CoA is then incorporated into citrate by citrate synthase. It's a reaction catalyzed in the mitochondrion and and if you take fibroblasts from patients and uh, incubate them with labeled glucose, universally labeled glucose, and then you follow up the uh, labeling in, uh, that shows up in the citrate, these this two uh, orange carbons, then you will see that uh, while you have some um, incorporation for, in the citric acid pool for controls, then in case of the PDH defect, you don't have this, you don't see the incorporation there. And this you can use uh, to, uh, to characterize in vivo whether this, this enzyme has a, has a defect. So part of the difficulty is that some of this, you would say that it might maybe easier to measure levels of uh, acetyl-CoA or levels of pyruvate, but sometimes these compounds are regulated independently by multiple pathways and there are some homeostasis. So sometimes uh, you need to rely on molecules that you could are abundant and not necessarily directly at the reaction you want to evaluate or, or monitor. So uh, just short uh, recap, I know this might be uh, obvious for some of you, uh, but yeah, it's difficult to uh, align this kind of technical talk on a technical audience, technical in many different aspects. So just short recap. So uh, our te technology that we're using this is mass spectrometry. And as you know, we have molecular weight. Uh, you, know, um, you can calculate that. Um, and this cartoonish uh, depiction of UDP glucose uh, uh, is here. Uh, so if you put it in a mass spectrometer, what you will measure, uh, in a mass spectrometer measure ions. And in this case, we are using deprotonated molecules. And you will see the, the typically monoisotopic ion and plus one, plus two ions that are coming from the natural contribution of 13C mostly, but also from some other natural isotopes. But of course you can use uh, stable isotopes to alert the, the labeling pattern there. 
And now, uh, when you're talking about mass spectrometry, there is a huge progress in recent days. A lot of people work with high accuracy, high resolution mass spectrometry that basically aims on having this number, uh, the accuracy of measuring the, the mass uh, very well. The, we can have the molecular composition determined very well. But um, if you're dealing with complex molecules, uh, sometimes you know, connectivity uh, is quite important. So what you want to do instead is to sacrifice accuracy a bit, but to be able to look at fragments. So the method of choice for me is uh, this typical subset of mass spectrometers, which are called triple quadruples, that use extensive use of, of fragmentation. So they basically have uh, three quadruple filters. Uh, so the ions that are coming from the ion source need to reach the detector to be recorded. And they pass two mass filters and a collision cell in between. So if you have your molecule entering, then there is only a narrow, typically unit resolve band that is transmitted and this molecule is broken into pieces. And then you uh, tune in the, the other, or the second, the first quadruple uh, for the fragment times. So this allows you to uh, monitor uh, the, the specific uh, fragmentation reaction by locking and in, in, into masses. Right. So, and the nice advantage of this that this allows us to uh, filter out a lot of potential isomers, a lot of noise. So, this is a technique that doesn't is not really sensitive by increasing the signal. It's very sensitive and selective by removing the noise. So, but if we're talking about labeled molecules, right? Then uh, for the labels, you need to um, adjust the masses, right? Because if you put six uh, heavy carbons here. Uh, then you have a mass shift, but on this part of the molecule. So the precursor mass will uh, change, but the product mass will not change. So you need to uh, have a different transition and you need to measure it in a separate acquisition channel. So, and of course, uh, when you think about molecules like this, there's multiple fragmentation reaction you might think of. So we'll be knocking off different parts of the molecule and they will have a different uh, selectivity on which parts of the molecule you can evaluate, right? So if you have uh, labels on these two moieties, uh, this uh, exos and this pentos, then they will show up in different fragments. So as you see, this so allows you to uh, have some um, um, ability to find out whether you have a mass shift of five, uh, where it is actually in the, in the molecule. But the problem is that this is actually quite a lot of fragments to deal with. So if we have an assay to uh, assess nucleotide sugars that are endogenous or relevant, in human, we have 24 compounds with 113 transition in total. And normally, um, these methods are developed more or less manually. So there would, would need to be a technician that just basically types it in into the, into the instrument software, checks it if it works, adjusts, and uh, this could be quite error prone, or even for the, for the just regular assay. But if we are adding labels that might be under different parts of the molecule, you need to be very careful when adjusting the matters of precursor and different fractions. And you have the labels of different parts of the molecule. So just if we consider some basic metabolic tracers that we can use, like universally labeled glucose or uh, amide uh, labeled glutamine, or just things like orthogonal labeling with glucose and galactose, where we, for example, would like to see uh, contributions of this to uh, sugars to the metabolism, we're getting quite a lot of, of, of transitions. And then you have your boss saying like you're reminding you that you have like hundreds of compounds waiting on the short list. So, uh, and as you can uh, guess how this, where this is heading is that the air ticket can be used to very well to monitor the uh, model, the fragmentation, right? Because fragmentation reactions, if you know what is happening, uh, can be modeled as uh, reactions, as reaction smarts. So here is the example that I wrote, uh, and, nucleotide monophosphate ejection uh, that just breaks the bond within these two phosphate groups and generates nice fragment ion. And as you see that I didn't put much selectivity here. Uh, and so, and actually I didn't put the selectivity for uracil. So this is actually works with any other nucleotide sugars, whether this is cytidine or adenosine or, or guanine. So uh, thanks to that, uh, if we are looking, so we wrote a software tool uh, that just takes a list of molecules um, with smart structures as input 
and uh, all fragmentations that uh, for this nucleotide sugar assay are basically encoded by uh, nine reactions. And I did a lot of uh, learning, and thank you, Greg, for the SMARTS tutorial that you wrote a few years back. It was really helpful to do that. And then uh, the tool also has the, some, uh, some logic to, to merge the different transitions, because sometimes uh, compounds are isomeric. You don't want to uh, put two uh, degenerate acquisition channels in the instrument. Some labels are undistinguishable. And for example, this can decrease the uh, the potential reactions even by approximately half if we use this worst case scenario that we are now considering with this uh, data leveling. And as an output, we basically have an instrument uh, ready uh, method uh, for a vendor format for the mass spectrometers come from the commercial vendors and they have their own format. But basically uh, this tool allows us to just feed Start with smiles and with the structures and end up with the with the acquisition method and also uh, the data processing method is also generated at the same time keep that in sync and for data processing we use the another open source project which is skyline developed for one target procurement the, these guys are doing great job so i wanted to mention them and and this has unforeseen advantages. So if the so this reaction that I developed for natural sugars uh, worked very well for the structures of synthetic analogs. So this is just a simple paper with it with colleagues from organic synthesis, uh, organic synthesis group just across the street from us. It were synthesizing some uh, fluorinated analogs of sugars, and we basically just took the structures, fed it in uh, in, the, in the program, and we were able to evaluate the inhibition and the effects on the on the natural compounds. So, uh, so basically it's, it's actually quite powerful and, and uh, simplifies uh, our work tremendously. But now there is an interesting problem with metabolism. It's, uh, that's a little bit different than organic chemistry because if we are having a metabolic pathway and you have a common metabolic substrate like glucose or glutamine, they will be metabolized by different pathways. And sometimes you will have the situation when you have a molecule with different moieties that will be synthesized with different pathways, right? So here you have um, uh, building blocks for glycan biosynthesis, which is UDP glucna, uh, UDP uh, N acetyl glucosamine, which basically is this complex molecule that uh, has the uh, sh this sugar moiety is basically synthesized by hexosamine biosynthesis pathway, which takes acetyl CoA that goes from glycolysis PDH. Uh, sugar moiety in uh, nucleotide is synthesized by pentose phosphate pathway, basically. And, and this is just uh, not mentioning the pyramid in biosynthesis pathway, which I just ignore conveniently for a moment. So if you would be looking in vivo and uh, the masses of the molecule that can show up uh, in the, as a result of the experiment, so you just measure glucnac and masses over time, uh, well, masses, uh, so these are precursor labels. So these are mass shifts relative for the unlabeled molecule for fibroblasts or incubated chrome and heavy glucose. So time zero, you give fibroblast heavy glucose and follow up how the label shows up. So the zero is the, the light um, label, that is unlabeled molecule that's basically washed out. And here you have the different masses. But what does this actually mean? What does seven mean? Uh, it's a pretty complicated picture. However, if you look at this in the um, down the mass spectrometry, basically the mass spectrometer breaks this molecule conveniently for you on this on this bond here. So uh, the fragment ion has only these five carbons, and these are in the neutral loss. But then you can use this to disentangle the labeling and then it just gets comprehensible right so here you have basically the uh, the activity of pentose phosphate pathway from the purple labeled carbons here you have the the incorporation of the of the sugar uh, here you have the uh, incorporation of the uh, just the acetyl coa and here you have a both of uh, these two because we do not have, yeah, the mass spectrometry is also quite selective. Not all the bonds can be broken easily. So you, for example, don't have an, any fragment that would break some bonds that would allow a 
us to distinguish the, this part of the model. So we have a sum. But this is still a, a big help in interpreting this complex metabolic pathways. So, uh, but part of the problem is that all this uh, labeled molecules in our tool needs to be fed more or less manually. So, as when I mentioned that, as our input is SMAS per, per molecule, but it also means labeled molecule. So, uh, we started in the first version that all this molecule needed to be labeled manually. So I would need to write uh, smiles for the 14 C carbons or 15 N nitrogens in a proper location, uh, which is quite a bit of work. At a certain moment, decided to just also use uh, Erdicate for that. So uh, using SMART. So if we would like to just uh, see the molecules that have uh, uracil uh, labeled on the position three, which is coming from labeled glutamine, so then you can write smarts in such a way that uh, you can just pinpoint that one. So uh, for me, it's quite convenient to use just a UPAC atom numbering. So canonical numbering, well, what do you mean canonical? Uh, Erdicate numbering is just uh, for canonical graphs, I believe. And this is a completely different system that is uh, not very useful to uh, tell your supplier that you would like to buy a molecule with this, this atom. So I decided I, I worked around this problem with just writing smarts in this way that the uh, match order is equivalent to the uh, atom numbering that I want. Uh, but I wonder if you guys know if there is any smarts extension that would give. Uh, named match reference like in regular expressions because I can imagine that for that this could uh, be a, a solution for this kind of problems um, wonder and now uh, just want to show you a little bit about what we want to do with this in the future so uh, right now all this uh, all this labeling is done by taking the smarts and uh, using the metabolic knowledge and manual intervention to just pinpoint where the label should end up for a specific pathway. However, as you probably know, uh, structures, reactions, uh, they're all in pathway databases already available. And we, we could just try to pull it out. And then there are atom mappings there, but they're not necessarily always uh, reliable. They have a feeling that it would be better to rewrite the whole metabolism as in, okay, in reaction smarts. So I actually started doing so, and and, and the test started with kind of benchmark whether the kit is good for this. So uh, I there are some, for example, unexpected limitations. So if you, for example, consider one of the enzyme TC cycle, so this is just a isomerase that moves the hydroxyl group from citrate to isocitrate. And the thing is that this is just, as we say, a simple reaction. It takes a non hero molecule, make a hero a product. However, the substrate is pro -hiral. And if it's labeled, it becomes viral. And then if you now try to make this reaction the proper way, that only one of the possible isotopomers should be generated. And somehow I failed to do so yet. So this is kind of like unexpected uh, issues when you think about doing certain things algorithmically. And on the long term, uh, like what this kind of technology can do is to build a tool to make a structure-based mass spectrometer fragmentation predictor. Uh, so that would be like a really good tool for identification of animal molecules, uh, which is a big problem. Mass spectrometer has a great sensitivity, uh, great selectivity, but uh, getting back from the masses uh, into the structure is, is quite a big problem. Definitely more difficult than uh, the separate molecular structures like the, the, the talk we had before. It's a similar kind of reversibility problem. So uh, at the moment, I'm using smarts that are built uh, manually. Uh, and a lot of this is based on experience, both mass spectrometer and some practice with, uh, with smarts writing. And usually write one transformation as for the one product line I can see on the spectrum. However, uh, this product lines often results from uh, multiple elementary reactions and for some are rearrangements. 
So you can imagine that you could define a set of elementary reactions and some rules connecting them and be able to predict uh, an aspect of an arbitrary structure. So you might be asking the whether people did that. Yeah, there is a lot of progress and there are some systems, but they're not really universal. So there are some systems for protein peptides, which is your sequences. And basically, most of the proteomics and protein identification is, is based on that. Uh, there are tools for lipids and glycans to give dedicated notations. Uh, but, and there are also some attempts for making the, the systems for metabolites. Um, and there are some bond breaking models and machine learning that's supported by the big spectral libraries. But this is likely, it, it, often, it, it works uh, for some cases, but in some other cases, it fails spectacularly. And maybe just because the, the, the algorithm behind it is not really chemistry aware enough, or it's just uh, too naive in certain things. So that would be something very interesting to, to work on in the future. So I think I'm closing to the end. I think you guys want to go for lunch, I believe, at a certain moment. I want to acknowledge my colleagues um, uh, and that it will work in there in our center in Nijmegen, but also some colleagues from Maastricht. Um, I want to honor them by <laughs> using their, their slate layout for this. I also want to ask the, uh, the UMD and Metax for the grant support for um, developing new technologies for diagnosis and treatment of uh, metabolic disorders. I want to acknowledge my former uh, postdoc advisor from TU Delft, uh, and he challenged me a few times and give some motivation to start working on this back uh, a few years back. And Luke Patani uh, from EPFL, that, uh, basically almost 20 years ago, convinced me that even for a lot of chemists it's worthwhile just to learn a bit of uh, bioinformatics and chemical methods. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Mark. It's always nice to hear applications of the RD kit, um, like real world applications, particularly when they are from areas that are far from my area of expertise. Um, so it's, I think it's great. I mentioned at the beginning the, the, the diversity of presentations we get. I think it's one of the coolest things about this meeting. Um, so the one question that came up is a question from Jimmy Croman as to whether or not you have the source code to the stuff you're working on available. Oh yeah, so that's always a tricky part. So uh, it's not a production quality code, definitely. I'm not a web developer. I'm, I'm not a developer myself, right? And and I could share some snippets, I guess, but the tool is unfortunately not ready for release yet. I plan to do so. But uh, yeah, when you're working in a, in a hospital, that current operation always takes priority. So yeah. I would love to, I would really love to be able to share that, but it's a little bit uh, uh, not the quality that uh, I would be uh, comfortable with releasing. But of course, uh, I've, I've definitely shared some, some experiences with that. Okay, cool. And, and I if think someone. I think it's just worth pointing out. I mean, most of us are used to dealing with research code um, and having the appropriate expectations when it comes to that. So I think you'd find people willing to accept the fact that it's not completely ready for prime time so they can try it and learn from it. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so, so please, please get in touch uh, if you're if you're interested. OK, um, so there's a question from Christoph Bauer um, mentioning that for synthetic organic reactions, um, there's a lot of data out there from the USPTO data sets, um, which uh, Roger and his colleagues have made available. 